Hello everyone and welcome to episode 11 of A Scotch and a Beer with me, Officer Dan. If you like these videos and it gives you any insight into why you got into drifting in the first place or how to do so, please give me a subscribe and hit that notification bell. I'd greatly appreciate it. So in the last episode, I made top 16 at both Vegas Drift and Top Drift competitions. I also made my first top eight at Vegas Drift. In my own eyes, I was on a roll. In this episode, I go ice skating, hit the final round of Top Drift out in California, round four, miss round three of Vegas Drift because of work-related shenanigans, and then proceed to suck at round four of Vegas Drift in front of the loving and adoring Formula D fans that came early. I also learned a very valuable lesson at that event of not letting other people touch your car. But first, a scotch and a beer. For the beer, I'm going to be going with something that my buddy jwoodmedia.com left um, as a parting gift from when he was out here not too long ago. Don't think I'm going to be able to open it because it's a real beer and it needs an opener. Let me see if I got something I can use here. This is not the best of tools. But we're going to make it happen for the people. So this is the Samuel Smith Old Brewery Tadcaster, the celebrated oatmeal stout. Product of England. Holler for Europe. Let's give it a try. And just as I thought, it tastes like drinking a loaf of bread. It's actually not bad. One of the better stouts that I've had. I'm not a huge fan of stouts because of how filling they are, but this one's pretty good. So I give this the recommend. For the scotch, I'm going to go with something I actually picked up on the road out to Grid Life in Colorado. I uh, shared it with some buddies out there. I just needed to have some scotch in the trailer. It's called the Pig's Nose. Now, I don't normally do blended scotches, but this one has a interesting name. And I went for it. It says that their scotch is as soft and smooth as a pig's nose. Whatever. This exceptional blended scotch whiskey has been created for us by Richard Patterson, Scotland's only third generation master blender. The whiskey's signature smoothness is rooted in its specially selected Speyside, Isla, and Lowland malts, which have been aged in oak casks. Marrying these with gentle grain whiskeys produces a whiskey that is truly as soft as a pig's nose. Now, I was actually pretty inebriated when I tried it last time. So we'll give it the actual try here today. Pig's nose. And they weren't joking. This is literally a blend of all of the different regions of Scotland into one thing. And it is a very smooth scotch. I normally don't like blended scotches because they're usually not the highest of qualities. But this one's not bad. For a blended scotch, I would definitely give this one a drinkable rating. I taste walnuts, I taste the smokiness from the Isla, it smells of toffee, the old pig's nose. Now, jumping right into the story. <clears throat> now, to start off this episode, I did have to miss the third round of Vegas Drift due to work at T-Mobile. Sometimes life gets in the way and you have to make sacrifices. I wasn't super high in the standings in Vegas Drift, so it was okay that I was missing it. It's not like I was going to get a license there. It was great practice. I ended up being in a meeting for Seattle for my team being recognized for all these accolades and kicking ass and taking names on social media, so I kind of had to be there. And this part of T-Mobile would be a very large reason as to why I decided to take the plunge and become a professional driver as well. So that will play more into the story as it goes along. Now this would have been around August of 2011, and at about this time, I made a Facebook post doing this. Okay, go! that that's out of the way, Jim and I would finally get to travel to an event together. The schedules lined up because this Pro-Am event was at a Formula D event and I wish it was still there in Las Vegas. 
And this is really awesome because as a pro-am driver, you want to drive the courses that the pros get to drive, but you never really get to do so. So for us to get to drive the Vegas track was an awesome experience. Now for some damn reason I didn't make a blog post on this event. I couldn't find any pictures, I couldn't find any information, but I do remember it pretty vividly because of the fact that Jim was there. So I'm going to recall the events as I can. Unfortunately, I literally don't have any pictures from this event, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. I do remember that we set up a pretty rad square-shaped camp between us and Matt Field. Ryan Bell was in there in the mix. And I think Otto Graven, when he was doing Formula D, was right next to Jim's big trailer. So it was kind of a, a weird mix of pro-am and pro, like in the same pit area, which was really cool for us. Probably not so cool for the Formula D guys. Like, who are these dudes hanging out with us? This sucks taking up all our pit space. Now the one thing I did find to help jog my memory on this was the scores. So I looked up the scores for this round and I saw myself there with a big fat goose egg and now I remember exactly why I got said goose egg and I'm going to get into that right now. Now this was the Vegas course that was the super long slide entry against the wall, back out to another wall, to another wall, and then you kind of snaked around and out to the finish. So this was one of the faster tracks on the Formula D circuit, and very much so the fastest track that I had done Pro-Am wise thus far. I remember going through practice and being like, this is really cool, I'm so glad I'm getting to do this experience, this is great car feels pretty good, everything's going okay. Then, as I was clutch kicking after the long slide, I broke an axle. I limped back into the pits a bit bummed out, but I knew I had a spare, so I was pumped on that. Because I didn't bring many spares at this point, and I was just happy that the one thing that I decided to break, I did have a spare of this time. Now, Jim and his crew were long gone by this point. Our practice and qualifying was well after Formula D's extra day on Thursday, so they had already gone out to eat, get rest, so that Jim could be driving the next day. I brought one pit guy with me, and he spent the entire time on the phone having girlfriend problems. So he was literally of no use, jacked up the car, got the axle changed out, and went back out for practice. What I didn't realize was that the axle had broken and kind of bounced around a little bit, and it actually bent my tow rod. So the wheel towed out a bunch, on, and I believe this was on the, yeah, this would have been on the driver's side. So the driver's side wheel was towed out, I didn't notice, changed the axle, went back out for practice. I did a couple of donuts, everything felt decently okay, I knew it wasn't going to be perfect, but it was better than it was not driving. I blast down the front straight, first, second, third gear, I go to enter, and I do a complete 360 right away because of all the tow out, it just made the car turn in super, super fast. And I just did a 360 and was like, whoa, okay, something's really wrong. And I went back to the pits to check it out. My pit dude was still on the phone. Some random guy that was walking around the pits, and I don't know who he was or his affiliation with anything really at this point, but he said, hey man, I'm really good at alignments. Let me align that sucker for you. Give me a couple tape measures and I'll make it happen. Just let me handle it. Don't worry about it. Give him the tools, give him the tape measures. I jump up on top of Jim's truck to watch people and, you know, pick up the lines. That's what I like to do. I like to casually observe and see if I can mimic what people are doing that are doing the course really well. And I'm like, great, you know, I need all the help I can get. So my pit guy's on the phone, so you're hired. Now he comes up and he says, hey man, I'm done with the car. Go back out for practice. And I say, all right, sick man. Thanks a lot. I really, really appreciate it. What I didn't know, and one very, very important lesson that I learned, is that he had changed literally every spec of my alignment. The front, the rear, I thought he was just going to tow that tire back in and I was going to be peachy keen. But instead, he decided to go ahead and realign the thing basically to OEM spec. So he took my toe out out of the front and almost had a little bit of toe in. He put the rear toe to zero, which made the car super slippery. And I didn't know any of this. I just jumped back in the car, gave the dude a high five, thanked him for helping me, looked at my pit guy who was still on the phone with his freaking girlfriend, and proceeded to go back out for practice. I mobbed down the straight. 
I'm at the top of third gear, which has got to be like 70 miles an hour, and I go to initiate, nothing happens. The car is feeling like it's kind of understeery. So I go to initiate harder and I grab the e-brake. The car immediately spins out and I go backwards into the tires at Mach Schnell. Devastated, I limp the car back out, take a couple of tires with me, and I go back into the pits where homeboy's waiting that just did the alignment on my car. He says he's not a drifter, but he works at an alignment shop and he aligned it to the best of his ability, which was OEM. It didn't tell me that before I went back out. I didn't think he was going to touch the front, but he did and it ended up making me wreck my car. Um, I can't fully blame the guy because I should have asked. I should have tested a little bit more, but I didn't. I just went full send and crashed. Lesson learned. Do not let other people touch your car, no matter how good of a mechanic they say they are. And as I go further into this, you guys will realize the importance of having a good team and people that stand behind you for what you're trying to get accomplished. I looked the car over, it's no worse for wear, it's busted out of taillight, and I'm really sad about the rest of the body kit, my trunk is messed up. It's not what I wanted to happen and kind of out of my control. The dude apologized profusely and I was just like, you know, whatever man, it's fine, just chill. I don't want to talk to you anymore, I'm going to go back out and try to practice. I aligned the rest of it to the best of my ability, literally just cranked out some toe and went back out on the course. I head back out and I'm in the donut box warming up my tires and I hear what sounds like another axle breaking. Oh! And I'm like, what the shit, man? How is all of this happening at once? I'm not having a good evening. I lit back into the pits, jacked the car up, and both axles are good. I'm like, oh my god, it's the diff. Now I'm running around looking for somebody with a spare S13 diff, and everybody's like, ah, I do have one, but I don't want to give it because just in case mine breaks and I make top 16, I want to use it. And I'm like, totally understand that. I don't want you to give me something that's going to screw you out of making top 16 or whatever. Qualifying was like 10 minutes away and I was like, well, you know what? I should probably call it quits at this point. I've crashed. I have no idea how the car is aligned at this point. It's probably pointing in six different directions with four tires. And I decided to retire to the top of Jim's rig in solitary and be sad by myself. I would end up getting another couple of goose eggs for qualifying and a zero overall for this round as well. So that's two rounds in a row from Vegas Drift that I had gotten zeros at. Needless to say, I was out of that competition for a license. I was disheartened, I was sad, and I couldn't really be upset because these were problems that I had caused. Now, I should have learned two valuable lessons, but in reality, I think I really only learned one. And again, that goes back to never letting somebody touch your car that you don't know. And this goes from grassroots all the way up to pro. Do not let anybody else touch your car. Everybody's a professional mechanic, but in reality, nobody really is. Just be friendly and politely tell them, no, thank you, I have a guy that does this. Even if you don't, just pretend. The lesson I should have learned at this event was to always take a crew with you that has the same goals as you do. They want you to succeed as much as you do. They want to be part of the team as much as you do. They want to be involved in you because they want you to be successful. If you bring somebody to an event and all they do is talk on the phone with their girlfriend who's having problems, that's not going to be conducive to you winning the event. You're stressed, you don't know where they are, you're pissed. There's so many other emotions that play into actually driving competitively that you have no idea that you had to deal with before. And so that happened to me at this event and then would carry over into my Formula D career. But that's a whole different story for another episode. Now with that huge failure of a round that could have been really, really good practice for me, I headed back off to California with a couple of different buddies this time for the last round of top drift. This would be round number four and I was hovering outside the top 10 drivers in this entire series. Now keep in mind that this series had like 59 drivers to start with and I was one of the top, probably 14 or 15 at this point. Stoked. 
Now, if I would have won this round, I may have gotten my license in 2011 in my first season of Pro-Am, but I didn't. The level of drifting at Top Drift was intense to say the least up until this point, so I had no reservations as to the fact that it wouldn't be intense at this event as well. And that's okay, this season of Pro-Am was very much a learning experience for me. I had kind of already expected to do at least two seasons of Pro-Am before I got my license so that I could get accustomed to traveling and learning how to deal with the crew and learning how to deal with the car and learning how to deal with sponsorships and so on and so forth. So I kind of gave myself a two season buffer to make it happen. But yeah, so I just wanted to get used to everything dealing with Pro-Am to kind of step my way up to Pro very slowly. I gave myself two years, etc. Um, had I not gotten my license, I would have gotten back to running local events and just traveling around locally and having a good time. So I, I never really intended to stop drifting, but I did set some limits to myself like, hey, you need to get your license or you need to stop because it's expensive. Now round four was at Streets of Willow, meaning it was a super, super fast entry. I would say just as fast as Vegas Drift, except for you huck in and you end up doing kind of a road Atlanta course where it sweeps back around and then comes back around on itself and back through the same way you came. And it was a night event, so our practice was at night, our competition was at night, and there was only 16 drivers, so the stress was off to make top 16, all I had to do was complete a lap and I would be somewhere in that mix. Which, again, top drift, you get three qualifying runs. I screwed the first one up horribly. I took out two inner clips on that run and ended up getting a 14 as a first score. <laughs> Dialed. Second lap out, nailed it. Hit the clips, had the speed, the only thing the judges said I could have done better was to have more angle and more smoke, which of course requires more horsepower, which I didn't have, so that was next to impossible to improve anymore on what the car could do. They said my line was great, I couldn't have improved on that anymore, which made me more happy than anything. When you get the full score for line, that means a lot. That means you're doing everything that the judges asked you to do which is very, very important in Pro-Am drifting. The judges said, hey man, if you can throw some more angle in and make a little more smoke on this part of the course, you'll probably get a higher score. So on my third run, I tried really, really hard to do that. Coming back out towards the last turn, I chucked a bunch of angle and came up super short, having to e-brake slide for like 30 feet just to hit the inner clip and basically straightened out throwing that run to the dust. Hey, I tried. I listened to the feedback and I tried. Now the second run I did was good enough for qualifying ninth place. So I was in the top 16 of 16. Cause that's all the drivers there were was 16. The end of the season at Top Drift, people get disheartened and they don't even show up to the events cause there's no possible way they were gonna get a license. I was gonna go regardless because I needed the experience. I just happened to be hovering around the top 10. Ended up getting another 15 point run, so I'm glad that second one worked out okay. Now my first battle of the evening would be against Jason Kim. He was a few points ahead of me in the standings and had qualified before me. So he was leading first. On his lead run, Jason spun out on entry. I shadily completed the rest of my lap and just put down a mediocre lead run and ended up getting the win on that one. Jason just got his FD license this year. I've known Jason for a long time. We chat back and forth on Instagram every once in a while. Drove with him in both of my seasons of Pro-Am. He's a great dude and I'm super pumped he got his license. I wish you the best of luck, hombre. So moving on to great Eight. My first top eight battle was against Ryan Bell, my pit mate kind of at the later half of the season. Him and Matt Field gave me so much advice on how to drive, car setup, suspension stuff. They totally blew my mind with all the information that I had soaked in and tried to mimic and they were just great pit buddies. I, I'm so thankful for meeting Matt Field and Ryan Bell during Pro-Am. It really kind of changed everything about my driving. Watching 
watching Ryan Bell drive was fantastic. He almost had the same car as me. He just had an SR instead of an RB. So we were almost adequately powered. Um, but now, for the first time this season, we were up to battle against each other. Ryan was a contender for a license at this event, so had I knocked him out, he probably would not have gotten a license, and I might have squeaked right in on my first season. That being said, Ryan led first and I did my best to keep up with him. I think this was probably my best following run that I had ever done. There was only one issue. When Ryan went to go enter, his rear tire debated. And so my problem was, is that I kept staring at his rear tire instead of his front wheels. And normally when I tandem with people, I look at their front wheel inputs. That's how I know what direction they're gonna go, when they're gonna flick back the other direction. It's, it's kind of how I pay attention during tandem. And so instead of looking at his front, I was concerned with his back because his tire was literally coming all the way off his rim to the other bead, like 10 inches off of his wheel and then getting sucked back in as he would transition. Now, credit to Ryan Bell, he never missed a beat. He literally finished drifting that entire course and I was stuck in this mindset of staring at the wrong part of Ryan's car and I didn't have the best of following runs. Like in my head, I was like, well, his tire debated and that makes it dangerous for me to follow him. So I should automatically get the win. And that's not the case in Pro-Am, even Pro to this extent. So we switch places and Ryan calls with five minutes, changes out his tire. They get back on track. We head out. I lay down the best lead run that I think I've done all season. And Ryan is stuck to me like glue. It takes a good lead run to have a good follow run. If the guy in front of you is shitty at leading, it's really, really, really hard to follow him. So I think I did a good enough job to where Ryan was glued to my door the entire time. Closer than I was to him by far. So the judges awarded it to Ryan, mostly because of the excitement level of him debating a tire and completing the course and my lack of proximity during my follow run. So Ryan would move on to the top four four and I would be knocked out in grade eight. Now as disheartening as that was to be taken out, I gave it my all and I was still super super pumped that I'd made it this far in one season of Pro-Am drifting. I was also really really pumped that Ryan would have a real shot at getting a license after taking me out. I wasn't gonna let him go out easy and I gave it my all but he did beat me fair and square and moved on. Now, ending where I did would net me 7th place at this event overall. That was my best overall score so far thus season in Top Drift. Even better than that, I'd end up 8th place overall. So 8th place out of 59 drivers that were really, really good. I was ecstatic. I didn't, I didn't know how to feel. I was super, super pumped and I was ready for next season. I knew the tracks now, which is a huge part of it. Once you know the courses that you're doing, it makes a huge difference learning the courses versus already knowing them and actually perfecting the courses. And if you've ever done Pro-Am, you'll, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Ryan Bell would end up getting third place at this event, netting him fourth place overall and a Formula D license. Congrats, buddy. You freaking did it. I was super proud to have made it this far. I was in the top 10 drivers at Top Drift for 2011. Super, super thankful to Jim Guthrie and Car Crafters for even allowing me to do this in the first place. Chasing my dreams at this point, and it feels really, really good. And that was all the convincing I needed to actually make sure that I made it a priority to get everything dialed for next season, and really, really make a run for my license. At this point, I could almost taste getting it because I had made that goal early on in the series where I said, I want to be a driver here at Long Beach. I want to be on this starting grid. I don't want to be part of the background. I want to be that guy. And I was one step closer to making that goal happen. And this 
is why I'm going to end this chapter of the story. Finally, I get to close up 2011. So again, reaching back three episodes, I had all of this Pro-Am stuff, two full seasons almost of Pro-Am going on, plus running events for the first time, no coast. It was a crowded season, to say the least. I learned so much about how to approach things, how to drive, where I actually ranked in the world of drifting that was still amateurs but trying to be pro, and I was stoked on every moment of it. And this takes us up to the end of 2011. And this, my friends, is where things get really exciting. They take a turn for the crazy, and your boy, Officer Dan, is born. Up until this point, I was Turbo Dan, or Dan Brockett, or whatever, just normal Dan. After this point, I would forever be known as Officer Dan. So this next episode's gonna be a really special one. I have a special scotch. I'm gonna buy a special beer. It's gonna be a great episode, so please stay tuned for that one. It's pretty nuts how I got to be involved in the first place. So I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching again. Please subscribe if you like these stories, even one iota. Regular Dan, soon to be Officer Dan, out. Catch you on the flip side.